Welcome, everyone. It's great to see everybody today. Whether you're a longtime worshiper, first time visitor, or online follower, we are glad that you're joining us today. We got a lot going on. Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow, uh, with our, including our junior volunteers. We got between 70 and 80 young folks who are going to be uh, here as a part of the experience. And if, if you're uh, joining us in person, to help as an adult volunteer. We're so grateful, but this is what you can do for us if you're not able to be here in person is just pray for us this week. You know, we uh, were not able to have VBS last year and we try to do it up big here. Um, and, and, and so we want to have a good showing, uh, share the gospel uh, with the young folks who are going to be coming to join us. Because of our new situation, a lot of stuff was planned to be outside. You might have seen the big circus tent that we set up to be able to make that happen. Well, we were dry for a couple of weeks, and now it looks like there's rain in the forecast every single day. So God's got it all worked out. We know it's going to be a fantastic week no matter what, but I just invite you to pray for us. I want to share with you that next week we are going to officially start having social hour again uh, in between services. So between like 9.45 and 10.45. So you can come and uh, that'll all be hosted in the, the Heritage Room. We're going to be doing stuff just a little bit differently uh, to be able to keep uh, help, uh, make people feel as comfortable and as safe as possible. But that's starting next week. Do want to share that um, we, we think that we've got most weeks covered, but it takes a small army to help make all that happen. So if you'd be willing to, to volunteer one Sunday a month, either on the setup end or on the teardown end, we would love to call the office, call uh, uh, Pastor Eric or I, or Kathy Friel is kind of really coordinating that all for us. But if you call the church office, we can get you her number, and um, that's going to start next week, next week, July the 4th. I want to just uh, share with you, let's see, I think that's all the... Uh, let's see, other announcements. I feel like my, my wife, Pastor Erica, told me something else, and now I'm drawing an absolute blank. And, and, and goodness, it, I know it was something important, and um, if she was here, I would tell her uh, that because she spoke to me, I knew it was important and should have known better than to not write it down. So, hey. We had an amazing concert last night with Teresa Lindell. She's joining us. We asked her to join us for worship this morning. Uh, if you came out, you know what a great storyteller she is and what a great singer that she is. She's going to share a couple songs with us today, just a little bit about her. <laughs> Resides in Greenville, Illinois. She's a math teacher by day and a singer-songwriter by night. Um, usually, at this time of the year, she's in Alaska for the summer. Uh, she does uh, work with the Inuit tribes of Alaska where, you know, these are, are folks who live in villages that are not road accessible and they'll fly them into a central place and have camp and she does worship for them. And so that's usually where she is this time of the year. And so uh, she graciously came and, and uh, did a concert for us last night and is sharing in the worship experience with us this morning. If you like what you hear, she's got some CDs. She just recorded her second one down in Nashville. Um, and all of that donation money goes towards that ministry and, of course, her uh, ministry up in Alaska as well. So give her some encouragement. We're going to uh, uh, welcome Teresa Lindell uh, to be our special music guest this morning. Give her some encouragement. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for those of you guys who came out um, last night. It was just a privilege to be able to share um, songs and stories. That's just, as artists, we just never take it for granted when we, when uh, just, you know, people who don't know us come and want to hear our songs and our stories. So um, I uh, did release an album in April, and it's uh, called The Stories Are True, uh, because I took stories from the Old Testament and wrote songs about them, which is a really fun artistic thing to do, and not many other people have done that. So um, I just wanted to share a couple other stories and songs this morning. Uh, they're similar. For, they're the same ones that I had shared last night, two of them, but just to share them again, and especially because one of them involves Dennis being God, and that's just, you know, really, you know, pretty fun. 
fun. So um, the story of Gideon is uh, the first song that I'll sing um, because I play the part of Gideon and then Dennis, Dennis plays the part of God. And so um, Gideon lives in a time when uh, the people of God are living in the promised land, but they're under attack uh, because they, there's been a lot of unfaithfulness. And uh, Gideon kind of finds himself pretty scared and basically down in a hole um, in the ground trying to like get some grain to eat. And uh, I mean, he's kind of a scaredy cat. You enter the scene and that's, that's what you see. And uh, an angel shows up on the scene and says, hey, mighty warrior. Probably doesn't say hey, but that's, that's all right. That's 20, 21st century lingo. But shows up and says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And uh, I read that the first time. I remember in college reading that and just being super baffled um, because we know that God doesn't lie. Um, so why would he show up on the scene and announce to someone who's really scared and hiding in a hole? And we kind of see throughout his story, like he needs a lot of encouragement to become a warrior. Like, why would God show up on the scene and say, you're my warrior, you know, if it doesn't seem like he is? Um, and uh, I think we can learn from the whole of scripture that like from the very beginning, when God speaks something, it comes to be, right? He said, let there be light and there was light. And uh, when he said, um, you know, let there be rain on the earth, there's rain on the earth and all these things, he just has to speak in it, it's there. And so when he spoke to Gideon, you're a mighty warrior, like that's what came to be in his world. And I think that's still true of our stories. And it's, so it's, it's just wonderful to reflect on their stories and, and know that, um, they, they become our stories because we say, serve the same God, right? He has the same character throughout history. So, uh, yeah, we're going to sing, we're going to sing Gideon. We're going to have a great time. So, down in the dust, that's where I was. Down there, starving for air and a purpose. Listening close for sounds of the foe. When without warning there stood before me a presence unknown, he said, Lord is with you. You are a mighty warrior, and I am sending you. Pardon me. Sir, but I tend to disagree, sir, with what you said. Can't you see we're oppressed down here in a hole? And why me, sir? For I am the least of all of my people. They'll need more of a leader to win a war.
the Lord speaks over our story, um, we continue to grow into the truth that is our story, right? Like when he speaks it, it becomes true. But, um, you know, sometimes I think Gideon, it took a while for him to catch on and uh, live into that story. And I think that's what we're called to do. Um, so the second song I'm going to sing is Mephibosheth. That's not a name you hear every day. Um, and uh, Caitlin and Jamie Meyer are joining me on this one. Um, uh, this story, uh, I just feel like it needs context because really not many people know about Mephibosheth because it's, you know, it only takes up, you know, like 15 verses in, in the Bible. But uh, King David, famous King David, David and Goliath, David, um, he became king, uh, but he replaced King Saul, right? And King Saul had a son named Jonathan. And Jonathan and David were best friends, actually. And David had been anointed by God and he knew he was going to become king. Um, but he didn't want to overthrow King Saul or Jonathan as he and Jonathan were best friends. Um, and he knew that, you know, God had placed that king in, in place as well. And so the, uh, basically a time came where the kings were in battle and King Saul and Prince Jonathan died. Um, and then King David started to rise to power. But essentially, um, as I understand it, back in those days, you know, if a new king took over, they would pretty much do away with the entire old king's family because they didn't want anybody coming back and, and you know, trying to take charge again. Um, and so that would be what would happen. Um, so a lot of times the old king's family would almost become an enemy of the overtaking king. And so that probably would have been what was natural. So the rest of Jonathan's family fled. Um, and Mephibosheth was actually Jonathan's son. So he potentially could have become king at some point. He was a uh, grandson of King Saul. Uh, and when he fled, he was five, and his nurse dropped him, and he became crippled in both feet. So his story went from, you know, potentially looking very, very good um, to just being the bottom of society, you know, immediately. A, a runaway, a cast out, and a cripple. Um, and uh, King David, though, made a vow to Jonathan uh, before everything happened. And Jonathan was like, can you, can you pledge to my family, like pledge to me that you're going to take care of my family? Um, and David said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And so um, David, when he became king, said, is there anybody left in Jonathan's family that I can show kindness to? And someone said, yeah, I know, I know of somebody. There's a Mephibosheth, is Jonathan's son, and he's crippled in both feet, and he's living you know, outside Jerusalem now. Um, and David said, bring him in. Um, and so when Mephibosheth gets brought in, uh, you know, David greets him. He's just like, I'm at your service. And David's like, you know, no, I made, I made this vow to your father. Um, you're going to eat at my table for the rest of your days. You don't have to worry about anything. He actually gave all of what had used to be Saul's land to Mephibosheth, you know, and had servants take care of it for him. He just treated him with this utmost kindness. And Mephibosheth's response to King David was, who am I that you notice me? Um, and I think that his story is our story. Um, you know, Jesus doesn't, uh, we don't deserve to be treated with kindness by Jesus. We even deserve to be treated as enemies um, because, of, because of our sin. But instead, Jesus welcomes us and, uh, you know, takes care of us and uh, forgives our sins and forgives our debts and allows us to live anew and allows us to live life at his table. So it's just uh, his story. It's just, um, I just consider it a privilege to be able to have written this song and then uh, share it with you guys. So this is a song called Mephibosheth. Come, let me tell you of all that's been done for me. You'll hear a tale of how mercy prevailed in my life. Though great were my misfortunes, all that I am will never forget who I was. I was the grandson of Saul. Then I was no one 
Left with no other boast but the man now on the throne. Oh, how can it be? Oh, what kind of king would show grace to his enemies searching to find me? The least of the least. Oh, who could believe there would be a redeemer for me? I'm no longer a tragedy. This is my story. was the scion of royalty but then I was orphaned with nothing to show for my name but two broken legs and you can imagine the fear that I felt when he sent for me from Jerusalem what is the worth of a life such as mine you are Jonathan's son, he said Don't be afraid There's a place at this table for you All of your days Oh, how can it be? Oh, what kind of king would show grace? just uh, come into your humble presence today, um, and we want to just, we want to pray for uh, Teresa's ministry. You know, she helps uh, stories of the Bible come alive, and it reminds us of, because it's these stories that connect us as your people. There might be some who are gathered here this morning, Lord, that uh, feel very disconnected from the world, maybe from their families, from their lives, their stresses that are going on that... Uh, Send us into isolation. But today's word just reminds us of how connected we really are through our stories of faith and our stories as well. Because when, you know, you sent your son Jesus into our life, it reminded us of a connection that cannot be broken 
if we would seek his guiding hand and grace. And so, Lord, uh, we, just, we, we, we lift up our connectedness today as a church. And we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you might bind us together in a spirit that would lift one another up. We want to pray for uh, the ministry that's going to be happening this week to a whole community of children um, through Vacation Bible School. And we, we pray that every day when those stories are lifted up, uh, that they come alive and they become real and they become a connective part of of the foundation of who those young people are because it's, it's really that foundation that helps us grow into the amazing and strong uh, people of faith that we, we are in adulthood. And so, uh, Lord, bless us and in these times where we're still struggling to come out of our quarantine mindset and into a place that is uh, ever-present with those around us. So, Lord, uh, we ask these, your blessing upon these moments as your word is declared anew as we pray together the prayer that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We uh, find ourselves in the fifth chapter of Mark today. Just get a little drink of water here. This is, this is a longer story, uh, and it's really two stories in one longer narrative. And you might want to just think for yourself as you're hearing this, you know, why don't you just pick one uh, of the two and just concentrate on that? But when you read them together, you really come to understand how they are inextricably connected to one another. And so today I'm sharing with you uh, the story of when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter, who is assumed to be dead, and at the same time has to pause as interrupted by a woman who is sick, has been sick for 12 years, and is in desperate need of being healed. So read along with me. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd had gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying, please come, put your hands on her so that she might be healed and that she might live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she had become worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. And he turned around in the crowd and asked, who, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering. Now, when Jesus was still speaking, some people came up from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what, had, what they had said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and he said to them, why all this commotion, all wailing and wailing? The child's not dead, but just asleep. But they laughed at him. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him 
and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. You know, our story today has two very different but two very intertwined stories. You have a parent who is desperately trying to save her, his daughter. And then you have, on the other hand, this unnamed woman who is desperately trying to save herself. So let's start off first with Jairus. Jairus is a, a local synagogue leader who comes to Jesus. He's, he's a person who's respected in the community. He's well off. He's a person of privilege. Folks know him, but his privilege does absolutely nothing to exempt him from the pain that he's feeling, from the fear that's inside of him, from his desperate thoughts. And he realizes that in the end, he's just like every other parent who has begged God to help their child when they feel absolutely powerless. Now the crowds that are pressed in around Jesus make way for Jairus to pass through. Once again, he's a leader in the community, someone of prominence. They let him through. And he goes up to Jesus, my little daughter is at her end. Can't you just help her? Please save her. I don't think that anybody else can. You know, Jairus is one of those few Jewish leaders that seem to recognize the authority of Jesus Christ. It's amazing, isn't it, what desperation does in our lives? It's help makes us uh, sometimes do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. And so without a word of response, Jesus goes with Jairus. There's not a moment to lose. Time is of the essence. But the crowds press in and they surround them, making it really difficult to move quickly through the crowd. They, they don't have time for any of this other stuff that's going on. And then it happens. Jesus just stops in his tracks. Who touched me? It's a strange question because they're fighting through a crowd. Lots of people just touched you, Jesus. He's being touched at every moment, but he knows that someone specific just touched him. Pressed in upon them, the gospel writer of Mark says. Come on, Jesus, we're in a hurry. But Jesus refuses to go on, on, to move forward. He pauses, even though Jairus, who's this prominent leader in the community, is desperate for his help. He knows that he has to pause, and then there she is. As if appearing out of nowhere, the woman comes forward. She knows that somehow she's been caught, and she falls at Jesus' feet tells him the truth about what's been happening. She has had this uncontrollable flow of blood and has been sick for 12 years, 12 years with this constant flow. She's seen all the doctors, done all of the treatments. I looked this up, you know, because uh, they, uh, about what would have been the, 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 the medical treatment during the day for a woman in such a condition. And so there, there's a rab, uh, rabbinical documents that list what the cures might have been if you had this condition during Jesus' time. So the first one is, is that they would have tried to frighten you to death, frighten the, the, the evil out of you, frighten you to death. And then there was this wonderful treatment that I found that sometimes they found it helpful Feeding a woman with this condition grain found that was extracted from mule dung. You know, on top of all of this physical suffering that this unnamed woman encounters, this particular element also ostracizes her, casts her out from the community that she so desperately desires to connect with, to feel loved by. But the purity codes won't have anything to do with that. See, women who were menstruating during that, their particular time of the month were considered unclean. So communities, villages, they had places that the women would go to. Sometimes it would be in a house. Oftentimes it would be a tent. 
And there are, there are these one. if you ever have time, read The Red Tent. It's the story of Dinah. And the, it, 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 it is a fictional story based on biblical facts. But it's the community that develops in the tent that the women go to once a month. And the community that develops there when they don't have to worry about the guys. Read it sometime. This unclean, you know, because touching a bleeding woman was totally taboo. I mean, you yourself would have been considered unclean. So this, this woman was not just isolated and deemed unclean during a certain time once a month. She had been dealing with this for 12 years. 12 years. Now, I want you to think about this in light of what we've just experienced because some of you have quarantined yourselves for a little over a year. How did that feel? Are you still struggling coming out of that? I bet you you are. Imagine what it would have been like to deal with it for 12 years. So in our story, as she, her, just her presence amongst the crowd is just absolutely scandalous. Because you, got, you get, think that all these people are pressing in and around Jesus, and she just needs to touch the, the hem of his cloak. That means that everybody that she has to get through to touch to Jesus is unclean. It's unlawful. She's breaking the law. Her presence in the crowd breaks the law. It's scandalous. She's bold. God bless her, she's bold. But she gets to where he is and touches his garment. And immediately she just feels that her body is being healed, that her bleeding is being stopped. Finally, after 12 years, she has found the relief that she so desperately wants. Now, I want you to think... In this moment where this woman who has been cast out of society, cast out of community, and yet at the same time has been dealing with these massive physical issues, the, the elation, at the same time that she is feeling the elation of being, feeling healed, I want you to just imagine to yourself how Jairus is feeling. Because his daughter is about to die. I mean, time is of the essence. I've been a synagogue leader, a leader of the community, respected. You know, I want your full attention. Stop wasting time. Focus on me. Oh, my goodness. How many times have we all felt that about ourselves? Me. But Jesus stops and finds this bold woman, finds a way to connect with her, calls her daughter, tells her that her faith has made her well, speaks word of peace and healing into her life, and just as she experiences healing and restoration, Jairus gets devastating news from some of his friends that, well, don't worry, you don't have to rush anymore, your daughter has died. Think about how you might have felt in that moment if you were Jairus. Would you have been happy for the woman or just downright angry? Jesus doesn't even stop to share words with Jairus or anybody. He goes straight to his house barges in, past the mourners, throws everybody out of the house and takes the dead girl's hand and just says, little girl, get up. And she rises because not even death is strong enough to stop the saving power of Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about Jesus' reaction in both of these situations because Jesus, in how he responds in both encounters, breaks the law. By having contact with this woman who had uh, this uncontrollable blood flow, he is breaking the law by having an encounter with her, by touching her. Same thing happens when, you know, you don't touch the, the corpse of a dead person. You're breaking the law. You become unclean. And Jesus doesn't even hesitate to break the law, to be a part of the scandal, because he's about healing and hope and peace and possibility. Not about breaking families up, but keeping them together. About making us whole again. Grabbing the hand of Jairus' daughter. Allowing the cloak of his body to be touched. And having this bold encounter with this woman who disregards everything so that she might have a shot at being healed. You can find those purity codes in the book of Leviticus and Numbers if you ever want to page through there. You have a hard time sleeping one night, you want to page through Leviticus and Numbers, you'll find those purity codes. But Jairus and the bold woman in our story could not have been more different. 
and yet they're connected to one another. Their lives intersect at this moment in time because of faith and because of Jesus Christ. You see, Jairus is a parent. Now, I can only guess that this woman who has had an uncontrollable blood flow for 12 years, there's probably not a possibility in the world that she could ever be a parent. So where he is worried about his daughter because he has the blessing of being a father, she is probably barren and not able to have children. He is a man of privilege. He's got title. He's got authority. She's a nobody. The story doesn't even give her a name. He's a religious leader. She has been cast out by her religion. He is wealthy. She has spent everything that she has, uh, has in her life at failed attempts at find, uh, of getting a cure for her body. He approaches Jesus with a formal request. She pushes her way through the crowd and doesn't ask permission. Nevertheless, both of these these, these life stories are in connected at this moment, interconnected at this moment in time because they depend on one another. I mean, have you thought for a moment because in both cases, the woman has been suffering with this uncontrollable blood flow for 12 years. That's the entire length of time that Jairus' daughter has been alive. Both in very different ways express incredible faith. Both fall at Jesus' feet. Both experience God's salvation, God's healing because of what Christ does. The woman and the little girl were both unclean in both cases. And in both cases, Jesus blows past the religious rules, breaking the law because he wants a new day for both of them. Jesus calls them both daughter. They're healing their salvation. It's, it's not a competition one to the other it's not, these two stories are not at odds with one another. I mean, the whole point of putting them together in this piece, in this narrative today, is that they are connected. And that's what the gospel writer wants ours, us to hear today, is that our stories are connected too. That's what makes the church the powerful place that it can possibly be. Because when we share our story of who we are and how we have become who we are, we find that even though those around us might have a different narrative about how we got to where we are, we find that we intersect when faith comes into play, when Jesus connects us. And so I think about how our stories would be told today if the gospel writer of Mark was sharing it. And I don't have to make one up, just put your life's tale there. What's the last tragedy or, or, or roadblock that you have experienced that you have felt powerless against? And there it is. And when you say that aloud and someone shares their story, we start to find out that we are so much more connected than we ever possibly realized. In a time in this world when so much seems so disconnected, the gospel writer of Mark wants to remind us how connected we actually are. Our stories are connected. As different as we are, as different as the way, ways that we come to Jesus are, whether with a sense of, of reverence and dignity or just desperation, whether we have privilege or whether we feel like we're a nobody, we all come to Jesus in our desperation. We all, at uh, the final moment, fall at his feet, and find salvation in him. Jesus today wants to look into the face of each and every one of you. And everyone who is so different than you are. And wants to call you daughter, son, child. You know, sometimes when our world seems so divided. It starts to feel like, you know, my healing is at odds with your healing. And that's just not true. The liberation of the gospel reminds us about how our healing is interconnected with one another when our stories intersect because of Jesus Christ. In our stories today, Jesus shows us that as different as we are, our healing will always and forever be bound together because what Christ has done. And that's good news. Amen.